with anything in life, isn't it? It's learning as you go along. It's, it's learning as you go along. I'd even go further to say it's trial by fire. It's literally... Oh my goodness. Try, no, Are there other confessions you could have given yeah, <laughs> Hello there and welcome back to the NatWest Business Show. I'm your host, Angelica Bell. And in this season, we're talking to some of the very best in business around their journey to success. And joining us this week is Josephine Phillips, owner and creator of Sojo. Now, it's a clothing alteration and repair service, enabling brands and customers to become more sustainable. She secured a pre-seed funding of $2.8 million, signed partnerships with incredible brands, all at such a young age. So without further ado, let's welcome Josephine. Hello, thank Hello. you for having me. It's great to have you here. Now, before we get into your incredible business journey, we're asking every guest to give us a business confession, something that you learned the hard way. It could be a business blooper, but it helped you on the road to success. So what is your confession? Yeah, so my confession, and I was thinking about this and I, not many people know this at all because I don't think it's something that people talk about at all. Um, but it's that when I raised our massive investment round last which year. Which is huge. It's huge. Huge. <laughs> it's absolutely huge. Uh, which leads to the confession um, is after we got the money, which when I was fundraising for it and pitching for it, it actually always hypothetical money because you're there being like, yeah, yeah, I'm looking for hundreds of thousands of pounds. I'm looking for millions. Like you're fundraising, you're pitching. And you actually, don't know whether you're going to get that money. No, you don't. You don't. I mean, you hope that you will, but you don't. And when the money actually dropped to my bank account, my bank account, our Say business bank account. <laughs> yeah, it's all mine. You know, a couple of milli, um, just casual. It was incredibly overwhelming. And um, and actually, I really struggled at that time with the kind of weight of responsibility that suddenly came almost overnight. Um, and I actually was going to send the money back. That is, that's the confession. So you did all that work? <laughs> I did so much work. No, honestly, I, I remember having the conversation with my sister being like, I don't want it anymore. Like I, I thought I did, but I felt so stressed by what mm. they then wanted from me and what I then needed to deliver on, which was everything that I promised. Yeah. And I, I actually was like, what do I do now? There's so much of it that I was like, is that an opportunity? Is that like, a, is that a situation where I could actually just, what would they say if it got back into their bank account? Um, but then realized that it is such a huge privilege that not a lot of entrepreneurs, not a lot of women, not a lot of black female entrepreneurs get um, that, to not take that opportunity and to not do what I wanted to do and yeah. was committed to doing would be in the wrong choice. So luckily, didn't send it back. Well, exactly. You wouldn't You're right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I completely get that because you have this dream mm. and you're passionate about it and you must have sold it well. Let's, and like you said, not everyone who has a dream and wants to set up a business gets that much funding. Mm. And I mm. can see that you acknowledge that you were blessed. Um, but you have to legitimise that. Mm. You do. You do, and it's entirely like it's especially at that time. It was it was basically me and my sort of one engineer team of two, but had to grow to such a bigger team. And and the hiring process, I didn't even know where to begin. I was like, I've never hired someone before. What questions do I ask? Where do I find them? How do I build a team? And it really, it's just I think you you take every day as it comes. And for me, what I was taking was the fundraising journey, and then it ended, and I was like, what next? Yeah. Now what do I do? Um, and so it's a big it's a big uh, issue to face, but um, made it through, thank goodness. So Josephine, your confession is that you nearly gave back $2.8 million. <laughs> That's it. That's it. That's a big confession. <laughs> it is. Isn't that wild? <laughs> Saying out loud, I'm like, what was I thinking? Well, exactly. Even I'm thinking, I know what I could have done with that. Um, so let's take us back to the seeds of Sojo mm. and the idea. Um you have turned your business round. You've collaborated with huge fashion houses um, and well-respected in this sector. So I want to know how it started mm. and how you've got to here today. It is, as we speak about these kind of big amounts of funding, it is not glamorous at the beginning. It mm. is the seed, the beginning. It is, it's actually, I think, quite stereotypical for a lot of entrepreneurs. And I'm going to sort of speak to two ways in which it got started. The first is a personal problem. So for a lot of people who start businesses, they face a problem. They want a solution. It's not there. And they're like, I'm going to build it. Yeah. And for me, what that was, was I was getting into sustainable fashion. I was engaging with my clothes in a way that felt more circular and they weren't fitting me because they only come in one size. So I wanted them to fit better, but I had no idea how to sew like so much of my generation. Um, and when I went to a tailor, I found the whole experience was really archaic. I mean, it's genuinely still 
paper ticket. It is writing down what you need doing, cash only. It is come back in five days. But I didn't go back for a couple of months because it's just like really inconvenient. So for me, I was like, wow, this industry has not been digitized. It has not, has not been modernized for the 21st century. And young people are increasingly wanting to engage more sustainably with their clothing. I have to build that solution. Um, but again, you don't just jump from that to then suddenly the glossy bits. The beginning for me was market validation. It was surveying 300 people. It was me being out on my bike, picking stuff up from customers' homes. The actual Sojo platform started as a Google Forms where you could put in what you your name, your address and what you wanted doing to your clothes. I would go pick it up, try and get a commission from the tailors. It was pure, scrappy, non-glossy, non-funded beginning. Um, yeah, but you were still doing the legwork. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, work is work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, understandably. You have to. And yeah. it's just going back to that thing about creating a solution. So mm. it's something that was very personal to you because, you know, at university, that was something you were interested in, mm. isn't that right? Completely, yeah, 100%. I was so, I was increasingly getting impassioned by sustainable fashion, but realising that quite often it comes with friction. If you want to engage with more sustainable practices, it's often more inconvenient and more expensive. And I was like, we need to make repairing your clothes, tailoring your clothes and loving your clothes for longer part of the cultural norm and as easy as it possible possibly can be and to do that it has to be tech enabled yeah we are in an era where that craft is mm. becoming much more of the zeitgeist and you know it's linked with sustainability whether it's crochet mm. you know stowing using a sewing machine I remember my grand teaching me it's, it's something that we don't really do now isn't it mm. but clothes are so personal and if we could engage with that and you know con control it mm. completely it's really exciting it is and I think that future is one in which, we, as Sojo, we're just trying to get more people on board with. And it is a shift in culture because we are part of a system right now where it is hyper consumption and hyper disposability. And going back to that craft is really crucial. That actually, someone asked me a question the other day being like, how can we get to that utopia of the future that you imagine of slow fashion? I was like, it's not a utopia. It literally happened 50 years ago. We just need to just go back a bit in time and engage with our clothes with respect, with time, with skill. Um, and that's what we're trying to bring back. Josephine, Sojo came about through personal experience and a dilemma, like you said, and you wanted to find a solution. But what I find interesting about your story and your journey is that you didn't have a background in tailoring or business. So where has this all come from? <laughs> it's true. I actually think back to when I didn't even know like what a startup was. And it's crazy because honestly, I now feel like, well, you're in an echo chamber when you've got a startup and you go to startup events and you're always around startups. It's like, wow, I didn't even know about this culture of how you grow a business or do anything. Um, but I was at university studying physics at the time, obviously had this idea for Sojo, uh, wanted to get started. Um, but I actually, one of the first things that I did that really taught me what a startup was and how you grow a massive tech enabled circular business was that I got a internship at um a resale a resale tech startup that was much further down the line um okay can we just stop there what's that got to do with physics so this must have been a passion <laughs> do you know what I mean <laughs> <laughs> Physics, what was I doing there? I think I was just good at physics at school and I chose it, but I literally was like, I'm not going into this. And um, which is, I think, which is also important because sometimes people think, it is. I'm studying this, I'm doing it this, is. I've got to go down this path. People are literally like, Did you go to LCF? And I'm like, oh. <laughs> not quite um, and I, I didn't come from a fashion background I didn't come from a tech background didn't come from a startup background so I think you realise that all these I think all these small things add to that kind of end result. So even with physics, like it was really difficult. I had to work really hard. It's probably what's helped me working very hard now. Um, and equally getting that internship at the tech startup, yeah. that taught me what it is to be in a startup, what it is to create a culture, to do something disruptive, something cool, and to try and change an industry um, and to scale something. I didn't know what it was before then. Did you do that with the intent to learn about this, you know, the business? Did you think, right, I've got, I've got to get this experience under my belt so I can, you know grow and work out if this is for me I yes and no I think like it it was I was absorbing with osmosis without the intention to be like I'm going to replicate this or I'm going to do this but I think if you add the pieces together it's like I learned that from there and realized that I could do that I learned that from that and realized I could do that and so I think experience is always absolutely crucial to any kind of success later down the line because it just teaches you of what to do or how to do something or what to avoid um and I think yeah, it, for me, it was an experience that made me be like, I could do this too. Mm. Well, the fashion industry does seem to be moving towards becoming more sustainable. Mm. Um, but like you say, there is still a little bit of a resistance, isn't there? Little, uh, I'd say big. Well, you know, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, you know there's, I'm there's, just trying to, you know, yeah. sit on the fence here. Um, but how have you dealt with that resistance and also trying mm. to bring, you know, those ideologies we had and 
back in the day, you know, of making our own clothes or, you know, appreciating secondhand, giving it to other people, you know, those sort of things that people are like, oh, I can't have that or it's done, it's done, I'm going to throw it away and get mm. something new. You know, how have you dealt with that resistance and how would you recommend other businesses who are in your sort of, you know, bracket mm. and doing the same thing to take on take on that resistance? Yeah, so it is definitely difficult because I think to challenge the status quo is always difficult, um, but that's what startups are for. They're there to disrupt, they're there to illustrate and show innovation and a future that is better. And I think that's what's really exciting for all businesses. When going up against bigger core, bigger brands who have their set way of doing things, you have to try and incentivize them to see a future in which they implement change to future-proof their business. I think for us, what we're saying is the current model of that overproduction and that hyper disposability that I spoke to and the sort of huge amounts of fashion waste, that's not the future. You know, that's not the future because of the planet we're living on and how it needs to be more sustainable. And so how can we get them to come along the journey in a positive way that means they're future proofing that business that still exists? And I think when you can kind of paint that picture of get in now, be that pioneer, be at the beginning of the point of inflection, make sure you're embedding disruption and innovation in your business, that's kind of what you need to pitch to them. And then hopefully at the core, of the core of it all, they actually want to do good and they actually want to do better and, and make a bit better business for a planet and for people. Well, those fashion houses, they're huge, but they still have to listen to the consumer at the end of the day. Mm, exactly. You know, they're the ones paying their bills and, mm. you know, giving them all this profit. But you're growing. You've had a brand refresh, uh, recent acquisitions. Um, like I said, you know, rising popularity and getting in there with the right people. As an entrepreneur, how have you dealt with this growth? Because you are going up against these big corporations, but you're still young, mm. not just in terms of age, but also in terms of your business. How mm. are you dealing with that? In terms of dealing with the kind of growth and the success, I suppose I, I think quite often about how uh, there's no sort of finish line for success. Um, and so every day I'm trying to treat it as what can I do that day or that week or that month? And I think a, a really great example of that is actually when my fundraising round closed, arguably that's a moment of success. Um, and one of our investors was just like, uh, now the real work begins, it's just the beginning. And I was like, gosh, you feel like you get to somewhat of a finish line, um, but it's not a finish line, it's just the start. And I think as you approach such behemoth challenges, which is creating hopefully what will be a massive business, global business, hundreds of employees in the end, you can't ever think about it in that way. And, and I think for me, um, how I deal with it is just what challenge am I facing over the next kind of four weeks? And that's all I can do. So taking every hurdle, sort of like having a little goal and then take, right, I've overcome that. Is that a piece of advice you'd give to businesses out there who are starting out? 100%, definitely. I think when you start right at the beginning, there is this, it feels like a mountain in front of you. And I don't want to be cheesy <laughs> and be like, you just got to start with the first step of the ladder. But it's the truth. I mean, it's genuinely how I get through what can be very, very difficult, which is building a company. Um, and I say it really often to my sister and with my dad, where I'm like, all I can do is what I can do today. And I, I, I honestly say that so often. And the same can apply to different periods of time. It's like, all I can do this quarter is what we can actually try and achieve in the next three months. Um, and I think breaking it down just makes it feel less overwhelming. Yeah. You know, you said that you had no background in sewing and mm, that side. Yeah. So, you know, for me, sitting back and listening to what you're saying, you, you're obviously very savvy and you've got this business mind. Thank you. But then maybe you've had to learn about the other aspect of it, sewing and, and that business, getting the right people mm. to help you. Is it a case of knowing your strengths and weaknesses? Absolutely. So you say that I've sort of got to know the other side of the business. I think that's where the whole piece around um, delegation comes in and understanding what you're not good at. I think for me, I absolutely knew that I wasn't the expert to even hire tailors. And really excitingly, like we work with this amazing kind of sort of pseudo head tailor, tailor, a consultant who's been doing it for 40 years, trained hundreds of individuals to become tailors. Um, and she works with us to help the hiring process, for example. And that's a learning, yes, in that one vertical, but in every other part of Sojo, whether that be around marketing or product, you know, I'm not the expert in that. And luckily I did start at the beginning and I did have the idea and I could dip my toe into all parts of the business, but it's also about who is good at doing what they can do yeah. and how can you find those people to support you? Yeah, because I think there's this false idea that if you get into business, 
you know, you know everything already, or you know, you're savvy and stuff. <laughs> you know, it's learning yeah. with anything in life, isn't it? It's learning as you go along. It's, it's learning as you go along. I'd even go further to say it's trial by fire. It's literally. Oh my goodness. Try, no, it's, Are there other confessions you could have given? Yeah, <laughs> it's just every. I mean, every day, the the challenge, the trial, the fire that's there, you put out, and then you realize for next time. I mean, when I say, and people say this, you know, what's your what's your learning, or what are your biggest learnings? And I could tell you my biggest learning from yesterday or my one from last week. I feel like the whole experience of running a business especially when it's your first business is all just about getting things wrong learning from that and doing better next time and I think that's why a lot of entrepreneurs are like oh next time around I'll do it better yeah and a lot of entrepreneurs start five businesses and things like that well Josephine it's time for us to interrupt proceedings mm -hmm. for a section we like to call trending takes so the team my trusty team have been scouring the internet for interesting topics tweets and takes that have been going on that we will discuss not that you need any more help with conversation <laughs> because you're very good. Um, for us to discuss, should we do that? Yeah, Are let's go. Friends? I'm excited. Scared. Okay, <laughs> so our first trending take is this. The customer is always right, whether they're right or wrong. <laughs> 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 I've got two battling personalities here. One is that believes deeply in justice and like rationale and there is a right answer. And the other that is a business owner and I care deeply about not getting yeah. a bad review. Because you see yeah. it on both sides, don't you? <laughs> well, completely. 100%. I think I believe if I'm going to go with a vote, the customer is always right. Nothing is worth an unhappy customer. Maybe. <laughs> what do you think? It, you're right. It's a tricky one. Mm. Because sometimes the customer, you know, sometimes everyone's out for something, aren't they? Mm. You want to try and get a bargain mm. or, mm. you know, <sighs> something for free maybe. But then there's business, there's someone's livelihood at the end of it. Mm. And that's why I always try to think, you mm. know, I think, okay, let's be reasonable. Let's make it work for both sides. But not everyone's like that. It's true. And I actually think that with customers who are doing something irrational, where they're obviously wrong, but the customer's always right, um, they actually can't see logic. Like they, they are, especially situations that I've had to deal with, it's you can't actually argue with them to a point of being like, but this is what makes sense and this is what's rationally right. They are angry they're annoyed or and and you actually just have to pander to that if you kind of want to do the right business thing yeah so are we saying the customer's always right they then? are they are <laughs> the, the customer um, yeah absolutely. yeah and actually i'm i feel that way i feel that we feel that way if i'm the customer i feel that way if you're the business you just gotta yeah. they are the they're the priority again i think it's because that is that link between you and the business sometimes and actually i had this when i was fundraising when they rejected sojo for an investment opportunity i was personally feeling rejected like very rejected as a person um and i think equally like if you get a one star review that's a one star review for you <laughs> and so i think yeah. you do have to make sure you kind of dissociate as much as possible but you want as much as you can to let people have positive experience for the sake of you know the future that you want to build with your company but also because reviews do funnel into other customers and and the kind of your yeah your future business Mm. Are you mm. ready for the next one? Yeah, it's on. quite hard actually. It is hard. It is hard. Okay. Next up, we have this one, which has divided some of the team actually. Whenever you spend money, you're casting a vote for the kind of future you want to see. I don't think that's hard at all. I'm coming down on the side of yes, that's 100% what you're doing when you buy something. Well, um, this is the premise of your business. Yeah, it's exactly. It's the premise of your business. It's the premise of if you believe something, your actions and your choices, which usually come about with financial kind of, yeah, like paying something is you wielding your power that you have financially for the future that you want for the world. And I think that absolutely it's it's a decision. If, if I spoke about not believing in sort of fast fashion and that model, and then I still spent my money there, that's under, yeah, undercutting my values. And I think equally whether that's supporting female owned businesses or black owned businesses or yeah. or just any any even if you're buying makeup i suppose you're making a choice about the future you believe exactly. in for women food for yeah food where it comes from where it comes from exactly what shops you're buying it from completely uh, whether that's meat or it, i completely believe it i'm curious what the other side of the argument yeah, is yeah exactly i'd like <laughs> to find out what's which half of the team <laughs> <laughs> do you can you see the other side but then sometimes some people don't have choice 100%. It's a, I think to be able to choose whether you spend money on a sustainable product versus not or whether you buy your food from a bakery or the supermarket, it's it's a position of privilege 100%. Yeah. Um, and that's something that, you know, I, I suppose we would say then for the question that when you're in a position where you are able to choose, yeah. it is you making a vote yeah. for the future. And I guess it, it relates to your business as well because 
to be sustainable, you have to have those choices as well. Mm. But then also, but then there are ways, what you're saying, there are ways to work around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, trending takes could be a whole podcast in itself. It could. It? <laughs> it's definitely good. We could definitely go, especially that first question. That one, that, I know that we could have gone that on one got us. Yeah. But I mean, that's the end of this section. But if you are watching this podcast on YouTube, please let us know what you think in the comments below because I'm sure mm. people listening will have their own take. Now, when I was reading off about you and looking you up. Oh, no. Oh, no. Stalking. <laughs> well, if that's what you want to call it. <laughs> I call it research. Yes, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> it was interesting because I just thought, oh my gosh, this is just a no-brainer. Mm. You know, because even as somebody whose body shape has changed over the years and stuff, you know, and I've tried things on, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, I really like this outfit, but it's just not fitting properly. It's mm. just, it's just fascinating to think that you've taken that concept and gone with it like not been afraid to do it. Mm. Maybe some, somebody else out there might have thought about it, but they haven't done what you've done. So clothes are a necessity and they define us, mm. don't they? Mm. So what can people listening at home do to shop and live more sustainably when it comes to the clothes we're wearing? And if they, you know, this is me and this is where they think they can only get their clothes. How can you convince them to be like, this is, this is another option or try this or, you know, get your clothes second hand and make it work for you? I think with trying to get people to change behavior in general and specifically around clothing and things that are so personal to you, um, we are a big believer at Sojo in it being non sort of finger waggy and non kind of negative, um, like talking about the negatives of the industry to try and get people involved. For us, there is so much excitement and joy in the ways that we can engage with the clothing that are much better for the planet and better for people and how they feel about their clothes. And I know this might feel high level, but when you have something fit you well, you feel great. Yeah. You feel really good. And all clothes should be like that. But also, actually, when you think about shopping secondhand, shopping online, on different sort of fashion resale sites or shopping in thrift stores or charity shops, you get to find unique pieces where they have a story and you get to be the only person walking down the street in that item. And that is, for example, one positive of engaging in slow fashion in a different way. With fashion rental, for example, you get to pick something that you would never buy that is a bit out there that you get to wear for one night. Or maybe it's that you get to buy something, you get to rent something that's usually way more out of your price range, but it's sort of 10% of the RRP. So what I really propose when pushing sustainable fashion for individuals is really how it's fun and it's more exciting and it's more creative and how you can engage with it and find more authentic joy than the sort of mass market trend focus, short lived dopamine hit that you're getting from fast fashion. And I think that longevity of items, building that sentimental value with pieces, something that has good quality that can last a long time and be passed down. How beautiful is that? And, mm. and that's what we're trying to get people to buy into. Do you think those big businesses are sort of hearing that now? Because we, we haven't really gone into the resistance. I want to talk a bit more about the <laughs> resistance effect because I saw you like, you just swept that under the carpet. <laughs> like, um, what, you know, what have you found in that aspect? I think they are actually paying attention. I think the fact that we are having so many conversations with, with brands and that we are launching with brands is an indicator that they are ready to make the change or at least build a future that they think is keeping up with the times. Um, a lot of them are launching resale and rental and repair. Yeah, and that are. is a good sign that they are trying to get a part of the piece of the pie that is changing a changing future and changing consumer behavior. And I think it's only a good thing because I truly think that they are the way that we can kind of get mass adoption. Like a startup can start and try and get people to be repairing their clothes. Um, and you go by person by person, community by community, trying to get people involved in your startup. But if you get the support and you use a vehicle like a brand who already has millions of customers to launch their repair scheme, that is already a way to mass scale in a way that is so fortunate for a company trying to get to that level. Um, so by using brands who are willing to come on board, it's, yeah, it's a fantastic opportunity to sort of scale your solution. Are they sort of saying, this is how we make our clothes. This is how we want it to sit. You know, don't, don't tamper with us. You know, it's that sort of mm. thing. Like if you go and go and buy something, you know, off the rail or high end, yeah. it's like, that's how it's meant to be, you yeah. know. You know, have you heard that? N not necessarily. I mean, we've definitely had feedback about sort of not wanting to not wanting to alter things so much that it changes the actual design. However, the fundamental pitch that we talk to brands about that works and that works to people and that works to brands and to works to anyone who we say that we say uh, that we tell about Sojo is clothing comes in sort of binary sizes 
set sizes, set lengths, set hips, set waists. And people are so unique. They're so diverse. Their hip, their waist, their length ratios are completely different person to person. Where they sit, how they have their body, it where they like the fit to be, it's so unique. So how can those two, two things come together? It can't. So what we're trying to get them to believe in is that their brand can work for people and individuals for their body in a much better way if they embed tailoring as part of that sort of personalization journey that they can bring to their customers. And I can imagine, Josephine, if you pitch it like that, you can definitely help change people's attitudes. Definitely. There we go. <laughs> because that's what we, you know, yeah. all on social media, everyone's talking about their bodies, body yeah. image. And if we embrace that more, then we're not going to feel bad when we go into a shop and have to pick up that one size. It's like, it doesn't quite fit. Exactly. Like we really believe in that it's not about you fitting yourself to the clothes. It's about fitting the clothes to you um, and making things work for you. And as you say, bodies change. So even if you buy something and your body changes for whatever reason, it's about not needing to get a whole new wardrobe and not needing to not wear that item and not needing to feel bad about that. It's about these clothes are meant to work for me and a good fit is something we all deserve. So is this a large education piece as well for the consumer that you're going to push out there? Definitely. So I think a big part of getting people to get on board with any kind of change in behavior is all about teaching them why, um, why it's important and how also it, easy it can be. And I think that we need to teach customers that not only is it good, it's also fun and it's also easy and it's also not expensive because there's misconceptions around tailoring being for the high end. So there are all these barriers yeah. and misconceptions that you need to kind of break down as a business. And all we can do, as I say earlier, is what we can do, which is trying the best that we can to kind of get people on board with the mission. Which is quite ironic because tailoring when my grandmother's alive was all about survival. Mm, it's true. It's so true. You know, teaching me how to cut out a pattern and like, and then at the time I was like, oh yeah, whatever. Now I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah. you know at least I can make it to fit and we you know all and stuff like that um so let's talk about some of your partnerships mm. you know how do you get them to buy into it and convince them that you are worth it yeah so I think it's it's kind of twofold the first is that if you're creating a business that you know can actually provide value to them it's purely well, that's the first step. Create a business that you actually think can provide value to other businesses. That's the most foundational thing. And I think even if you have a business that you wouldn't necessarily think works for a B2B angle, it still maybe can if you pivot slightly. So even Soja at the beginning, it was direct to consumer. We were doing repair and alterations for people in their wardrobe. But then you think about how could that shift slightly to creating software that enables brands to offer repairs to their customers. And we're also the back end of the order fulfillment. So you have to be a bit creative in it. But then when you do know that you have a solution that is worth it for a brand, um, you have to sell. It's it's hardcore sales. I mean, the amount of um, LinkedIn messages I've sent. I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah. again, it's kind of grassroots going back to me with the streets and the surveys and the getting started at the beginning. It's dropping a message saying, I'm building something that I think could be really interesting. This is what it could add to your business. Would you like to have a call? And then knowing your sales pitch, listening to what they say their problems are so that you can come in with the solutions, realizing that industry-wide returns are one of the biggest issues that the fashion industry faces. And fit is a really big reason behind that. So mm. they have a problem they want to solve. You have a solution for it. You just need to get in front of them and then convince them that that is the future. So basically for you to get some of those partnerships, you had to graft. Oh yeah, you do. You definitely You have do. to send those messages. You have to do. <laughs> Sometimes they won't respond. No, there's um, loads that haven't responded. Yeah. But I think you have to get in there. But also, you also have to be committed that with these bigger brands and with B2B partnerships, it's a long lead time. Like even we've recently launched with a really exciting big department store. Um, but that's a year plus of conversation. So Josephine, what's the most important piece of advice you would give to other entrepreneurs looking to create a strong long-term and successful business like yours like you're saying you know you're looking to the future you've got these massive plans but you know as as you've also said there's hurdles along the way so what advice would you give to other businesses yeah my advice would probably be to don't do it um, <laughs> no it's not no it's not it's not, it's not actually no it's, it's it's a challenge the whole thing's a challenge I just think people also need to be aware it's very difficult um but no it's obviously I think it's it's simultaneously the best thing you could possibly ever do um, and the worst thing you could possibly ever do. Um, it's it's definitely difficult. But I think um, if I had to come back to the most central bit of advice, um, I think it's about, and again, I don't want to be cheesy, but it's about having a lot of self-belief, a lot of self-care, a lot of support around you. Because as I lean into the kind of comedic notion of like, it's very difficult, which it is, um, to get through it, to do what you have to do, to face challenges, rejections, failures, 
incompetencies personally every day um, and to always trying to strive to be better, you have to have a lot of self-belief. So I think, I mean, I've even had practices of saying things to myself in the mirror or making sure I journal and write and, and have a lot of affirmations and also a support network of people around me who are like, even if it ends tomorrow, what you've done is incredible. And like that kind of consistency of you know, the affirmations that let you keep going is so important. So my advice is, is there are so many, yeah, there are so many tangible bits of advice that I could give regarding business, but all of them come back to you needing to be a really strong person and individual. Mm. And with that comes support and self-belief. Do you feel proud of yourself? I do. Yeah, I do. I really do. And I, I honestly believe that's come from the people around me allowing and creating space for me to feel that way. Um, when I when I worry about things or things go wrong, it's like you've already done so much. And I think I do, I fundamentally have that. And I actually think one of my favorite parts of the journey and the business journey in general, and something I do say to even friends and other people in similar situations is no one can take away what's already been done. Um, and you will always have that, or no one can take away the person that you were when you did that, or no one could take that achievement that you had. It's happened, the past is the past. So like you can't change that. And I think that's something that makes me feel really good. You've got another job. <laughs> <laughs> It's hard work here. No, it's fun work, isn't it? <laughs> it is fun. I'm having much fun more than if I wasn't it. <laughs> oh, bless you. Rapid fire questions. Lovely. I love these. Slash. Yeah, let's go. But most people don't do rapid fire. They start like doing another podcast. 100%. I'm going to, is it one answer questions? Only? One, one word answers. One word, one, one to five. One to five. Okay. One to five. I like compromise. Just want the, I want the Should rules and regulations of this game. You like to know the parameters. I'm competitive. I want to get this right. Okay, here we go, babe. Yeah. Who is your business inspiration? Sharma Dean Reed. Oh, good. Oh, see now, am I allowed to expand? That's what I was going to say. I? I, we said five, and I'm like, why? <laughs> she is a trailblazer, first sort of black woman in the UK, I think, to raise venture capital funding. Um, broke the ceiling for a lot of us, a lot of women, and yeah. has always put women at the centre of what she's done. What's your best business hack? Delegate, delegate, delegate. One thing nobody's talking about in business that they should be. Some people are talking about it, but not enough are funding more women. Best piece of advice you were ever given? Enjoy the journey. Yeah. Mm. Okay, final question. Your confession was about wanting to give back $2.8 million that you had secured for funding. But do you forgive yourself, regret it or wish to forget it? Forgive myself, for sure. Don't regret it. You can't regret feelings. Um and I, yeah, forgive myself and not regret it. Yeah. Well, we're going to end there, unfortunately. Thank you so much for being here today and sharing your incredible story, Josephine. You have been a dream. Um, and thank you for watching and listening. Please hit follow and subscribe so you don't miss out on our next very exciting guest. And if anything in this episode has inspired you, I'm sure it has, head over to the NatWest website for information and tools that help you take those next steps to success. <laughs>